All right. Well, turn in your Bibles to two different texts. One is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, and the other is Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. But before I read those, let me open us up in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you give to us, even material blessings. We know that this earth is not our home, and we know that our hearts are prone to uh, wander, and especially after uh, seeking treasures on earth. We try to find something lasting where uh, the moth and rust and the thieves break in and steal, and all those things that we, we know with our minds, but yet our hearts um, cling in our sin to the, these things that are dust. We pray that you would forgive us of that. We pray that you would now, by your Spirit, lift our eyes even through the wise stewardship of these blessings to testify to you and your bounty, to testify to your Son, that though he was rich, became poor, that we might become rich. We pray that that would transform our giving, our hard work, and our looking to you to give to us exactly as you see fit. Help us to be content with that and help us to make uh, this Eighth Commandment and using these goods a matter of worship and giving you glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. First Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. The Apostle Paul says this, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. And then in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, Jesus says, So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So we're calling this the golden rule of goods as and we saw that's built into the catechism answer, and these words of Jesus that we just heard extend to property. In fact, it's been said that Jesus talked about money more than just about any other subject. Now, of course, that's going to depend on what it means to talk about money or simply to use it as an illustration, a parable, perhaps for something else. But having said that, money talks. You know, you hear that expression, and... More often than not, somebody's trying to extol money in a, in a bad way, but it does talk, and God has made it so, because it talks about God, one way or the other. It either tells the truth about him, or it lies about him. And so God designed all of our material goods in that way. And what we saw last week, you'll recall, that all property is really about stewardship, the, the things that God has given to each one of us to glorify him. Really what we're seeing here in this golden rule, no matter what else you see, you're going to see this. Do unto others stewardship what you would have others do unto your stewardship. If, if you grasp that, you'll get the whole positive demand. Of the Eighth Commandment. Well, here's the way the Catechism puts it in question 111. But what does God require of thee in this commandment? And the answer is that I further my neighbor's good where I can and may, deal with him as I would have others deal with me, and labor faithfully that I may be able to help the poor in their need. And that last part's really crucial to everything else. All these things so that I can be a blessing to others. So the three parts we're going to look at today, number one, we're going to look into the deep theology of it, and we're going to see that raising an abundance unto others glorifies God. Something about doing that, whether we're rich or whether we're the thief repenting of stealing, and, and we're getting back in the game that way and, and starting to work with our hands, doing honest labor. Whatever, wherever you are on that spectrum, you're doing that because of what it says about God. So the first point may seem a little obscure and deep, and what's that got to do with the Eighth Commandment? But we're just going to build a theological foundation of what that says about God. Secondly, we'll bring it down to us, my neighbor's good 
and not my liquidation is the whole goal here. I have to do that because of the way that we talked about it last week, the way that anything property related is very badly under attack today. So let me say that second one again. My neighbor's good is the goal, not my liquidation. You say, well, you got to do that to be good for your neighbor. Well, that's what I want to challenge right there because the Bible knows nothing about that. And then thirdly, very briefly at the end, we'll, we'll add an application for the church that the needs of the saints actually come first. And we'll see that in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So those are the three places we're going. Let's go deep into the theology behind this golden rule first. We're going to see that raising an abundance unto others glorifies God. It reflects something about God. First, in the nature of God himself. Now we're going to go really deep first. God, being eternally blessed in himself, blesses others. The very nature of who God is. And God making much of that in Scripture. Setting his glory first, his blessedness for him being for himself first is going to be the best news you ever heard. Central to the Reformed understanding of God is that God does all that he does for his own glory. He's not only sovereign, but he's self-sufficient. Theologians call this the aseity of God. It's not really a popular one in Bible studies, but it just means his self-sufficiency. All that he is is of himself and in himself alone. He needs nothing. He puts himself before anything. And of course, it would be impossible otherwise because before he created anything else, he alone exists. So the only cause he could have for something else is in himself. He borrows nothing. And one implication of this is that God is his own happiness. God is his own blessedness, and everything else we understand, even his love toward us in the gospel. People trip on that when they come to Reformed theology. What about John 3.16? This is what backs John 3.16. This is why he can be good for you, because he draws attention to himself. Any possible good toward us is entirely out of his own infinitely greater love for himself in the Trinity. I didn't have my notes, but Jeremiah 31.3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I continue my faithfulness to you. The only reason God loves anyone outside of God is because he has to be there, all blessed in himself, first. I think it gives you a little bit of a hint of why I would bring this up as far as us being there, working and being blessed and having good things. We have to be there. We'll, we'll get to it, though. This is the theological foundation. And all of that theology raises some pretty interesting questions for, well, why did God create if he's self-sufficient and he's his own blessedness? So those are very good questions, but we might consider the words of Jonathan Edwards, that it is no defect in the fountain, that it tends to overflow. And he's talking about the blessedness in the Trinity. Now, we're not going to answer any questions like that tonight. Well, then why did God create if he didn't need anything else? For our purposes, the reason I'm bringing it up in view of the Eighth Commandment is that we need to take special note that God's blessedness in simply being, in being the fountain of being and goodness, is the only hope of other happiness existing. The only way others can share in good and receive good is if good exists, right? And if you put it that way, of course, everybody should be able to say, yeah, that makes sense. The ultimate paradox of a God-centered theology, but it's one that's inescapable, is that because God puts himself first, therefore, he can be good for us. When he makes creatures in his image, the implications for that image are massive. The implications for God's God-centeredness and his self-sufficiency being good for us, being the only possible fountain that overflows to us, is that he makes images who are also best for others when they are most flourishing. We talk a lot about human flourishing today, and usually it's by a bunch of people who believe that the only way you can be good for others is to drop dead. 
<laughs> and they call that the social gospel and all these other things that go with it. And it's very, very anti-reformed and anti-God and anti-gospel. So as we bring this down from God to us, we will notice that we copy him in a sense. Not by me. So if God makes much of himself and I want to copy God, I make much of myself. No, the way we copy God in that is we make much of God. And we're going to start seeing how we do that, at least in this area, with handling goods. We are blessed to be a blessing. This is the second way to see the theology of it. We see this in covenant history with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and others. Many great saints in the Bible were blessed by God with wealth. And so at that point, you can't say, well, surely wealth, yeah, it was okay back then. And nobody would say, well, God made a mistake, but you see something maybe happening different in the New Testament. That's not true, okay? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, but also Job. At the end of Job, he has all that stuff. Um, and of course, it's a sign of the eternal state. Nevertheless, he has all these things returned to him and restored. David, Solomon, Presumably in the New Testament, Theophilus and Lydia, though they were not apostles or main characters, they were being blessed with the gospel, and they had wealth. And then, of course, Joseph of Arimathea in the New Testament. But since Abraham begins this covenant line, it's worth noting that the words that got all that covenant of grace started have implications here. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. The same so that that we hear to the thief in Ephesians 4. We hear to Abraham when God is going to bless him. Now, if you reconcile Hebrews 11 about all those great saints in the Old Testament, if we reconcile that with Paul's admonition through Timothy that we saw last week in 1 Timothy 6.18 to tell pa pastors to tell the rich in your congregations to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. And all those wealthy people in that hall of faith in Hebrews 11 did follow the golden rule of goods. Their treasure was in the city to come, that's true, but they moved toward that eternal treasure through moving things in this world. God was not ashamed to give them physical blessings. So one of the things we want to see is that physical blessings, that though they can be a snare, and we see that in Deuteronomy as he warns Israel, nevertheless, God giving them and us handling them is not evil. And hopefully we, we caught that last week. But the third way to see the theology of this golden rule, this is the last part of the deep end of the pool, is not just God in eternity, not just in the image bearer, but then Christ. In the incarnation, Christ's self-sacrifice was not an end in itself. And yet, now, why did Jesus come to the world? And you say, to lay down his life for his friends, to sacrifice himself, to give himself up. Well, that would all be true, but more needs to be said. People could say, well, didn't Christ come to serve and to lay down his life to, to give up himself? Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Or again, in Romans 15, 3, for Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So yes, Christ did lay down his life. He gave up himself. He was others directed. In the incarnation. His reason for being here was a self sacrifice. He died that you may live. As that acronym for grace says, grace, or sorry, God's riches at Christ's expense. And so that's all true. But is that how the story ends? Is that the ultimate? If it is, and I'm not quite sure how his sacrifice could have been any good for anybody. Listen to the scriptures continue. In Hebrews 12, 2, for example, that we are to look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. 
Now, one wrong way, just as a side note, to read that verse is, I was the ultimate joy set before him, or that we, and so forth. Now, he does indeed inherit us, and so therefore we become his joy. But that's not his highest end. You see in Philippians 2 that he humiliated himself and came down low as a servant, and he all the way to the point of death, so that, and then, then what follows? His glorification the, to the glory of God the Father. And so the author of Hebrews is saying that he sacrificed himself not as an end in itself, but for some greater joy that drove him to the cross, which became the means of obtaining that greater thing for himself. He gained us, yes, as part of it, but he gained glory for God the Father. And so it is with us. If we were to sacrifice as an end in itself, which, by the way, that's Buddhism. That's drop-dead religion is Buddhism. The end of it is self nullification that's the goal is non-existence and that's a long story there but at any rate that's not christianity it's not self-sacrifice as an end in itself jesus is always telling us pick up your cross die to yourself but why it's so that you can live to your real self and john 12 24 gives a good rendition of that in the synoptic gospels it adds information whoever would hate his life in this world will gain it for eternal life. And so he adds that information. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 13, when he's defining love, and he's, he's sort of distinguishing true love and, and false love. You might say today, virtue signaling versus real love. And he's, he gives an interesting example of a counterfeit to love in chapter 13, verse 3 to the Corinthians. If I give away all I have, that's self-liquidation. And if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. So apparently you can give away everything you have to the poor. You could die a martyr's death and do it in a way that's not loving. But the interesting thing about it is that he appeals to our sense of gain. If I don't do this for love, I gain nothing, which might seem odd at first. But let's keep pushing through this. And you'll see what this has to do with helping people in terms of their material goods. Let's look now down to the ground of practical things. My neighbor's good is the goal here not my liquidation. Part of what Paul is saying here is that you can die a martyr's death in a way that stops. In other words, I draw attention to myself. I'm the point. But see, if I'm less than God and I die for you, what does that do for you? It doesn't do anything for you. It draws attention to me, but I'm not what your soul was made for. And so I draw attention to myself and the whole thing terminates. There's no good news there. This is not sacrifice as an end in itself. Note that even in the form of the golden rule, we see Jesus appealing to the principle of self-care. Matthew 7, 12, So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Same thing, by the way, in Ephesians 5, a love for a husband for his wife. He appeals to self-love there too. For no one ever hated his own body, you see what he's doing there? The same thing. And so he's appealing to your sense of not just self-preservation, but self, I'm just going to use the word again, flourishing, being what God made you to be, gaining. The desire to be treated well is made a criteria here by Jesus. It's not the highest criteria. It's not the end goal either. But yet the rule makes no sense without essential self-love grounding it. Even in those words of Jesus that Paul later reports in Acts 20, it's more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. What is he saying? Well, he's saying give to others because that'll be better. What does blessed mean? For you. You will be happier. And we can talk about that more later. But you see the appeal to one's own blessing and giving to others. Listen to Isaiah. In Isaiah 58, 6 and 7, speak about 
what to do with your wealth and your power. And he does it in the context of fasting. It's very interesting. And of course, what's fasting? It's, a for, it's at least this. It's giving up self, self-discipline. It's at least that. And he says in Isaiah 58, starting at verse 6, Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? In other words, to take care of your own, your family, those who are near you. And so fasting, this self-sacrificial act, and yet even here, self-sacrifice is not the end in itself. Making sure that the poverty relief that he's talking about worked you know when, when god commands you take care of that guy does that just mean sort of dropping a money bag over your shoulder and patting yourself on the back that you've done your job or do you actually care that the thing is being taken care of that the real person has that and is that your joy or is you drawing attention to yourself because you checked a box and so our whole hearts, in order to be in this, have to care about that. So we've talked about wealth not being the great evil here. And one way to see that is that in the Bible, there is, there's opposite evils. And you could be guilty of something, whether you have wealth or poverty. And so one particular prayer shows that in Proverbs chapter 30, verses 8 and 9, where it says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or, lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. So it's interesting. We don't avoid the idol of stuff. I'll just call it that. The idol of material gain. We don't avoid that by changing places between the rich and the poor. Okay, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna idolize stuff, so I'll liquidate myself and be poor. Problem solved. But the problem's in here, fundamentally. And so the contentment with our goods, keeping busy, being faithful with that, is the antidote, not to deny yourself as an end in itself. And so that second point is very, very, very crucial that follows that theology. To further my neighbor's good means to maximize his stewardship. I see another image of God there. I see another being that God has given a stewardship to. He, he's not being fully human if he's not working, if, he, if he's not doing meaningful work, if he's not feeding his own, if he's not moving. And I care about that. If I love him, I won't simply throw some goods that way and check a box. But I will actually care about the way that God has designed him. And so when the catechism question uses this furthering my neighbor's goods, how much further are we talking about here? How much further is further enough in furthering my neighbor's goods? Of course, you can't control it. You know, the whole question of, you know, I see somebody on the side of the street, he's got a sign. I don't, you know, he could be getting liquor. All that, that very practical question that we all ask. You can't control all the outcomes. So I'm not, not saying that the commandment is demanding us to make sure that that guy follows the course. That's not possible for any of us. That's not the point here. But that, that is our actual goal. We want to do charity in a way that is on that trajectory, that is aimed in that direction. And so the answer is, well, further, that's for sure. I, I want to further his stewardship. Not in the sense of some maximum of material consumption. Well, I gotta make that guy as rich as possible now, or as rich as some other guy. That's not the point. Any of these things, him consuming or saving more and investing more, or getting the right job, any of those could turn into idols as well. So none of that is what we're talking about either. But we do have to further their stewardship. What specifically has God called my neighbor to excel in? 
given the way that God has wired that person, gifted that person, their natural abilities, their spiritual abilities, what God has called them to, and yes, what material resources are available for this. Now, that's a big list there. And immediately you might start to, well, I can't care about people then if I, unless I really get involved in their lives. And that's exactly right. Um, that's the way the Puritans, by the way, used to think about charity. It was very invasive. They actually discipled you, the whole person, your, your spiritual and physical needs together and treated you like a, a human being. And that's the way the Bible understands charity. Now, the Pharisees had already beaten the modern statist to false charity and doing charity for a show and transferring money that could have been used voluntarily by real people to help the actual people that God placed in their lives like their parents. And so in Mark chapter 7, verse 11, Jesus is castigating them for this. He says, you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban. And then, of course, Mark defines that word for us. That is given to God. Some kind of a religious offering that was special in that sense. They were using to divert. Anyway, he continues, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother. So the only difference between the Pharisee in the ancient world and the statist in the modern world is that the Pharisees made it a religious tax of sorts with no heart to it, rather than a secular tax. But in either case, it was checking a box. And against all this, the Eighth Commandment teaches us that maximizing stewardship for other people is real productive charity. Incentivizing their stewardship is real compassion. On the other hand, incentivizing their permanent status of slavery and dependence is not. And by the way, I'm not just picking on the state and redistribution. The church can do that. Church can just throw out money without um, discipling people, without following up, um, things like that. And, and that would be bad stewardship on the part of the church. And we have a word for saying that you have some kind of a virtue, like love or compassion in this case, but it's just a show. Back in the day, we, we would have called it grandstanding. Now the kids all call it virtue signaling, and I, and I think it's a very, very good term for it. Jesus just called them Pharisees, doing that as just a show, without actually looking at the person that God has made and saying, I'm going to invest in your motion." and get you as an image of God moving again. We work hard. In all the verses that we're looking at, we work hard so that we're there, so that we can, so that we're able. And the crucial words in the catechism answer are labor faithfully that I may be able to help the poor. Two crucial words in that. And it makes no sense without these two words. That and able. And that's in the Ephesians 4 text and the other text that we looked at. Work hard that you are able to bless the poor. What does that mean? Let me clarify by ruling out what it cannot mean. You cannot read that verse in the reverse, as today's socialist mindset would have you. Help the poor that you are not blessed, which comes to mean not able. Hard work has to gain blessing before it can give any blessing. Notice that this principle is so obviously true that even those who are thieves in the New Testament, and so they have nothing aside from their theft to give, they are commanded the exact same thing as the rich are and for the exact same reason. Ephesians 4.28 again, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. There's a lot here, by the way, for young people too, as well as they're growing and work hard and get this job and don't just splurge or whatever. And part of that is so that you can help people as members of the church, people that are in need. 
But about that verse, the repentant thief, notice, is starting at zero. He doesn't have an inheritance. I mean, if he repents, he has to give all the stolen goods back, as Zacchaeus did in Luke 19. And yet Paul sets the same principle before the thief that he would before the wealthy. And so we can see that what unifies these principles, what unifies the rich Christian's obligation and the repentant thief's obligation is the same cultivation of blessing. The blessing is not the enemy. Getting rid of the blessing, cursing the blessing, will not help the poor. You cannot give what you don't have. And you cannot continue to give what you mindlessly liquidate if you once did have it. And that brings us to the third point. Very quickly, the needs of the saints come first, which doesn't mean that, you know, the churches have no responsibility for those outside the church. But there is a pattern. You see it in the Old Testament already in Deuteronomy 15, verses 7 and 8, where it says, If among you one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God has given you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. Now notice it says in your towns. Now that's back in Israel. But again, we want to understand our covenant theology and our uses of the law. This was a type of the church, Israel was. It was for your brother. It was not principally for the Edomites or the Philistines, much less the Assyrians or the Babylonians, that wealthy Jews were to share their abundance, but with their poor brothers and sisters. And you say, well, that was just Old Testament. Well, we see it in the New Testament. It's the consistent teaching. Right away after Pentecost, it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 44 and 45, that all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, like I said last time, a lot of people, you've heard this before, take that in the wrong way and say, yeah, they, they joined a, a cult and they didn't have any. No, they still had houses. They were meeting in their houses, which means they still had jobs. All that means is that whoever had needs. And at that point, they hadn't developed the structure of elders and deacons and stuff like that yet. That was coming. So, so don't take that out of context, like they all just abandoned their lives and, and joined a commune. That's, that's not the point of that text. But they did care and share with those in need. Paul says in Galatians 6.10, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. And so I just bring that in as a footnote, but I think a very important one, that the church does come first in that sense. And we'll see a, a reason in just a second. But first, let's look at these uses of the law, the civil use of the law in the Eighth Commandment.